let's just keep moving because otherwise that's why I'm... I just want to talk about these different kinds of conduct a little bit more um, and just think about the reasons why we need to do this. So sometime on Monday night I'm going to release an assignment question to you. I am purposefully not releasing it until we've done at least this and Monday night's worth of work, right? Um, in fact, I will release the problem after I release the recording of Monday night's uh, session. And so part of what we're doing here is working out, well, why do you need to distinguish these things? Why do you need to think about what these different kinds of conduct are? And your immediate task is going to be, you're going to need to solve a problem for someone. Uh, you will be a work experience student working for Dennis Denuto. Anybody met Dennis? Okay, so while you're relaxing and waiting for that problem, you can watch the castle and remember, Dennis is the absolute best supervising lawyer for any of you to work for because Dennis is clearly technically incompetent. So if you work for him, you need to double check everything and make sure that it is right. So you can't just rely on doing a half ass job and um, his red pen will sort it out. So that's why I like it when you work for Dennis. And Dennis, who often goes off to Bonnie Doon for a bit of a break, is probably not going to be available to answer your questions because in the real world, if your boss gave you a job to do, um, chances are you would get to ask them questions along the way. But unfortunately, Dennis is not that approachable. Uh, so you will have a couple of weeks to do that. But again, you want to make sure that you get it right because if the Law Institute starts cr cr climbing over Dennis's files at some future time, you want anything with your name on it uh, to demonstrate that you've done research and that you have cited your sources and that you have addressed the problem. So part of this will be about reminding thing, Dennis about things like how potentially this might be an invitation to treat as opposed to an offer. But in the real world, what we're doing here is we're distinguishing between different types of conduct so we can work out whether we're going to offer an acceptance, whether conduct it fits in the rules or not. But also thinking, just as you did a minute ago, if you were acting for Manchester City Council, how can you use these things to protect your client or to structure your client's contracts around the other way. So, invitations to treat. We do need to remember that it's not a free for all. So section 18 of the Australian Consumer Law, we've spoken about it already, the old section 52 of the Trade Practices Act says, you can't just be misleading or deceptive. The carbolic smokeball company these days that the ACCC would be after them before Mrs Carlhill needed to institute a claim because it's, there is a misleading and deceptive conduct issue there first and foremost. So an invitation to treat may constitute a separate collateral contract and we'll talk about what that means as we go forward. For now, I want you to just be able to distinguish what the conduct is. Um, so, ooh, where am I going? I've gone backwards there. I oh, don't, no. forwards, sorry. Backwards, forwards, we'll get there eventually. Okay, so, actually I'm not even gonna bother with that slide that I skipped over. Fisher and Bell is a really good starting case. So Fisher and Bell is actually a um, criminal law case. So there was some legislation somewhere that basically said it is an offence to offer flick knives for sale. I can't remember whether it was Mr Fisher or Mr Bell, so I won't even try. One of them is a shopkeeper, the other one is a copper. The copper walks past the shopkeeper's shop and sees a glass display case with flick knives in it. I can't remember off the top of my head whether they had prices or not. Don't think it really matters for this purpose. So the copper goes in and speaks to the shopkeeper and says, hello, hello, hello. What's going on here then? Um, I'm going to do you for breach of section umpity ump of the whatsoever it is law that says you cannot offer flick knives for sale. And the shopkeeper says, I wasn't. This is merely an invitation to treat. 
people come in and make offers to buy flick knives from me and it is not an offence to accept an offer to buy. Now I'm thinking that the shopkeeper didn't necessarily make this up on their own. They had some elegant legal counsel to help them. And the court said, yeah, you're right. The language was, in the absence of any definition in the Act, extending the meaning of offer for sale, that term must be given the meaning attributed to it in the ordinary law of contract. And as they're under the display of goods in a shop window with a price ticket attached is merely an invitation to treat and not an offer for sale. Okay, that just seems like legal trickery. That's the sort of thing that would have my family members yelling at me over dinner for a long time about how lawyers think they're better than everybody else and how it's all going to hell in a handbasket. I am going to argue the other way, that if we have laws that are likely to, when they're breached, that will send people to jail, then actually we need to be very clear on what they mean. And it is the job of the people drafting those laws to get that absolutely right. An offer for sale is a term that's long been understood in the, um, uh, and what an invitation to treat is, has been long understood in a legal context. Um, and it's their job to absolutely get this right. The other thing that is worth noting that contract cases, most of the time, well, almost, I can't think of a time that it's not actually, a contract case will be in a civil jurisdiction. So the evidentiary burden is, um, it's on, a, on the balance of prob probabilities. So when we think about something objectively, we will think on the balance of probabilities, it's more likely than not that this is how the facts fell. In a criminal uh, case, the burden of proof is beyond reasonable doubt. So here we have a criminal act that is looking at, or the, or the criminal offence goes to this wor these words in contract law. So to me, it makes absolute perfect sense that you need to get it right. So if you're going to invite people to treat with you, if you want that to be an offence, that's the language you need to use. Point of having this case in here, language is important, it's really important and it'll be one of the things that you will really have to work hard on, particularly as you're doing assessment um, uh, tasks because the assessment criteria will look at the consistency of the way that you use the language. Similar, almost identical case is Partridge and Crittenden. I like including this because his name was Partridge and he sold birds. So it was an offence in this particular area to trade or sell birds. And Mr Partridge put an advertisement in um, Cage and Avery Birds. Gee, I, I hang out for my um, edition of that every week. Um, it stated Bramble Finch cocks and hens 25 shillings each. Uh, Mr Crittenden, who was an undercover plod, went to buy it. Here he was basically charged um, Partridge with um, an offer to sell contrary to the law. Partridge appealed and it was held that there had been no offer to sell, that the legislation hadn't been contravened because the advertisement is an invitation to treat. An advertisement is a statement, I've got this thing to sell and I will treat with, treat is an old fashioned word for negotiate, um, I will treat for pe with people who are prepared to pay this amount of money. The classic case is the Boots Cash Chemist case. Those of you who have been to Manchester have no doubt been to Boots for a hangover cure. I know I have on more than one occasion. So Boots is actually a really interesting business. They really disrupted chemist shops. So, and, you know, and it's a bit like a kind of classier version of the discount chemists that we see around a lot now. The, um, so before Boots came in, most chemists uh, or pharmacists, they were like sort of single operation, small businesses. And they, and Boots really changed the way that 
pharmacy worked in the UK back in the early 50s by turning it into more like a department store. So they don't just sell chemists, the things we expect to see in a chemist, so drugs and prescription medicines and, and you know, walking sticks and, I don't know, toilet cover seats. Um, but cosmetics and a range of, they brought in that sort of thing, small appliances, pretty much nothing you can't buy in a Boots if you go into a big one in the UK. Uh, and so, and this is actually, it's kind of a nice little picture. This is one of the first, first boot stores in the 1950s here. So there was some legislation, uh, the Pharmacy and Poisons Act, which made it an offence for a person to sell certain type, types of drugs other than under the supervision of a pharmacist. And so the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain, probably important to understand who they are, they're kind of like the chemist union. So a bit like the Law Institute uh, will be, is basically the lawyers' union. It's, it's a club of people in a profession and they are charged with basically trying to do what's in the best interest of that profession. And so unsurprisingly, when things were being disrupted, they said, no, 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 we don't like this at all. Um, they argued that by allowing people to pick up things, including their drugs in a basket, that Boots was not complying with the requirement of the Poisons Act or Pharmaceuticals and Poisons Act, which required certain drugs to be um, only sold under that supervision of the chemist. Um, now, what they're really doing is saying, excuse me, there's this massive, big, high investment that's taking our customers away, and we really want to make it as hard as they poss we possibly can for them to compete with us. So think, it's always worth thinking about why is this action brought in the first place? What, what is it that we're really trying to solve here? So the plaintiff here argued, so the Pharmaceutical Society argued that the drugs were basically purchased at the time somebody put them in their basket. When the customer put the stuff in their basket and because there wasn't a supervision, the supervision of a pharmacist at that point, then the law had been broken. Boots, on the other hand, said the legislation hadn't been contravened because at the point of time when somebody actually made payment, there was a supervising pharmacist at the registers ready to come and look and supervise and sign off on any purchase. Um, so for that reason, they said that the sale was effected by or under the supervision of a registered pharmacist um, because until then, there was no contract made. The court agreed with Boots. So this is a classic example of an invitation to treat as opposed to an offer. And they pointed out that unless the contract is made at the register, then there is in fact no ability for somebody to actually take something out of their ba basket and put it back. So whenever we buy anything in that super... So the contract is made at the point of time when you take the goods to the register. So who is actually the offeror at the register and who is the offeree? The person buying the product. The person who wants to buy the product is making an offer. The offer is usually made without even any discussion at the price that is stipulated on the item or on the shelf. Now there is an overlay there under the Australian Consumer Law if there is a difference between the price that's uh, at the register and the price that's on the shelf, the lowest price needs to apply. But technically you are making an offer to purchase the goods at their advertised price and that offer is accepted at the point of payment. So when this law says supervisor can come in and look over the top. I've got five minutes. So I'm going to talk about auctions and tenders and we'll talk a bit about withdrawing offers next time, but we should get there. So the auction and tender stuff I think is pretty simple. I sort of feel like it's just the questions in there because you're tired and we just want you to feel a bit confused. But because you understand where we've gone. So in a real estate auction, who is making the offer and who is accepting it? 
So has anybody been to an auction? Has everybody been to an auction or know how an auction works? So let's imagine that I am auctioning something. My favourite device of all time, this clicker. It is available for sale in this room right now. I'm looking for bids in excess of a million dollars. Do I have anybody? Do I have anybody making a bid? Anybody at all? I'll accept 900,000. Is there anybody? Aren't I making an offer? Didn't I just make an offer to sell it to you at a million dollars and then I reduce my offer to 900,000? You guys are too smart. You're exactly right. In fact, what is most likely happening in an auction is that a person who is acting as the agent for somebody else is gathering, is basically inviting people to treat. That's what I was doing. I'm inviting you to treat. I will have instructions. Usually that instruction will reserve a minimum price that I can sell at. But I'm inviting you to treat. When you make a, a bid, are you, you're not accepting anything, you're making an offer. The offer is actually only accepted when the auctioneer, acting in accordance with instructions, well, assuming, you know, basically pulls down the hammer and says, okay, that's accepted, a contract is made. Um, the next part of the trick question is, well, what if there's no reserve? Well, that just doesn't matter. It just means instead of having a minimum price, the reserve really just goes to the instructions that the agent has. Because usually auctioneers are agents. Very few people come out and auction their own stuff. Questions, concerns about that? So I don't know you yet, so I've got no idea whether you're just tired, which is quite reasonable, whether I'm incredibly clear and helpful to you and so you have no questions or whether you're shy, all of that will come out over time. So I think we've explained, well I feel like you understand the rule. All is good. There's nodding there but if you don't, um, and we've talked about that already, there is a case um, but we don't actually have access, I didn't even realise that we didn't have access to the full text of it anymore. Um, but that's AGC Advances and McWhirter and there's just a little case-based summary that's available through the reading list with that. Um, yeah, really lots of slide there. Sorry, I need you to be louder for me, please. Yeah. AGC McWhirter has, yeah, it is, absolutely. There is an earlier case as well, which is in your textbook, um, the name of which escapes me right now, but AGC and McWhirter, uh, Finance and McWhirter actually uh, cites that. So that's an Australian case, which is easy. Tenders, tenders are like auctions, only instead of everybody being in a room yelling, effectively everybody gets to make one bid. So a, a request for tenders is an invitation to treat. Um, when you make a tender, so you respond to a tender, depending on the way it's worded and what you're doing, you may in fact be making an offer. You may well just be uh, demonstrating sufficient interest to get into a room to negotiate. It will depend on how it is set up more than anything else. But people can get caught. Key case here is um, Harvella and Royal Trust, which is a Canadian case. So what happened in that one is Royal Trust said, I want you to submit. So Royal Trust was looking for people to tender to provide services to them. Submit your tenders. They basically said, we will go with whoever's going to pay the most. Um, so they got a couple of different offers at the same time, tender responses. One was um, Outer Bridge who said, we're going to pay 2.1 million bucks or 101,000 more than the highest other bid you get. And Harvella said, we're going to, um, oh, sorry, I've clearly copied and pasted there. Harvella didn't offer another 101,000, right? They offered the 
There's no chocolate for identifying typos in my slides because clearly I do it as I go. Um, and so they basically said, okay, we'll go with Outerbridge because ultimately they went for the highest price. Harvella says, hang on, that's not fair. We, you know, that was kind of uncertain and we had a higher bid, you should go with us. Um, and the court said, well, what did the court say? The court said, well, no, because at the end of the day, this was not a negotiation. Because of the way the tender terms had been set, they said, we will accept the highest price. So the person, that was the one criteria. So it was actually an offer. The tender was framed as an offer rather than an invitation to treat. So if any offer made by you is the highest offer received, we bind ourselves to accept provided it complies with the terms that we've set out. And so the call to tender itself was an offer because they'd said this is the criteria. So again, if the call for tender or call for bids at an auction is we, I, you know, and, and this basically happens in auctions when the auctioneer says, okay, we're on the market. I will accept the highest bid made from this point forward and a contract will be made at that point. It's effectively the same thing. They are bound to accept at that point. They are bound to accept the highest offer. So a contract will be made. I feel like I'm worrying you. What's your name? Me? Yeah, you. I'm Sunny. Sunny. Yeah. You look stressed by this. Are you going to auctions often or <laughs> am I, uh, is it making sense? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's totally making sense. Uh, but actually, I got a, a very small question because, like, in I like small questions; <laughs> they're my favorite. Because in the normal life, like, um, we also we, uh, usually we make an offer, and it's not uh, possible to withdraw. Mm. But in the textbook, it's that actually before the hammer is that saying that sold, actually the offer could be withdrawn. Yep. Is that the real case? Even that is. Now, we've got to remember with real estate auctions, we now have so much legislation that sits over the top of it about proper conduct at auctions. And so there are rules to stop dummy bidders, for example, people pretending to bid to get the price up. So those have affected the way these things work in common law. I'm really talking about common law here. But if we take it out of real estate auctions and think about uh, buying toilet paper at a supermarket. Okay, so the advertised price or the usual price of toilet paper might be 80 cents a roll. And at the moment, if you can get your hands on some, you might be paying $4 a roll. Now there's price gouging and all of these other issues that might come out of the legislation, but at the end of the day, there is nothing to stop you from getting to the cashier and saying, actually, I'm not prepared to pay $4 a roll. I'm offering you 80 cents a roll here. And if the, uh, the vendor accepts your offer at that point, you have a contract. Now, the reality is they're probably not going to accept your offer because they can get $4 a roll for it. Or they don't have the authority because the legal personality you're dealing with is Coles or Woolworths or Aldi or whoever it happens to be. It's not the checkout chip. I'll make him gender neutral. Checkout chip can't make that, uh, that decision. But as a matter of common law, that is your right. Um, and you can make a perfectly valid contract in that way. Um, and I would suggest that we should be doing that because that is ridiculous where things are at. Um, it is five past four and I've broken my first promise to you, which is that I will finish on time because clearly I didn't do that. I think this is a good place to finish. Tomorrow night we are in a different room. I will be there nice and early to make sure that the tech works because I do not want to be in this situation again. Monday night, sorry. I'm just excited to spend time with you. Uh, so we're in building 94, which is over the road up there. Um, I haven't been into the room yet, but it's just that way. It's even a little bit further than this, yes. So have plenty of time. Come in, bring your coffee. I don't know if there's anything to eat. I've never even been in that building other than there's quite a nice library. Uh, T no.
There is no... Oh, good, good question. Okay. Yes, there is a task that if you wish to do it, please get it done by tomorrow so I can give you some feedback. It is in the assessment task because that is the only way I can do it and give you feedback. It does not count towards your mark. So every week for 10 weeks, there are discussion problems. So basically they are little problem tasks or little essay prompts. If you write it and get it in before that time, I will give you feedback because I am an incredibly nice person. Um, but it will not count towards your marks. However, there is no doubt in my mind that there is a direct correlation between people who do at least half of those tasks and people who do in the top 50% of the curve on the exam because they are similar levels of difficulty, particularly in the second half of the semester, not so much in the first, they're a bit easier, to exam questions. Uh, and I mark them and give you feedback as if you were doing them as an exam question. They are not meant to cause you stress or grief. They're supposed to make you happy, um, but sometimes they do cause you grief. They are particularly useful to those of you who find it difficult to go from theory to practice. So they are useful for having a go at practicing. Um, there are a hell of a lot of you in this class and I am just one person. So chances are when we get to the middle of the semester when I have to mark in the order of 90 papers from you that do count towards your mark, that you are really going to need them back, I will be slow at responding to those ones in particular. And that's why I've got the cutoff. The other advantage of those is you can't see anybody else's responses until and unless you put in a response yourself. But once you do that, you can see all of the responses that are there and future responses as well. You will learn a lot from each other if you do it and you will miss out if you don't. And that's one of the reasons why I will lock it down because some people cheat. So do you just add it on the comment tab? Uh, basically, yeah, there's a, a, there's a reply, it's a discussion prompt. You just basically reply, please, don't upload a document because that's just some I just cut and paste your response into the discussion so I can read it and give you feedback there is a rubric there so and it gives you a sense of what it's like to do it is that in quizzes or is that now the quizzes mark themselves so I don't have to be involved so you can do them anytime you like and it's really just me managing my time and does that count towards our no okay. it just know. helps you learn okay. no so you can do it if you wish you cannot do it if you don't wish. What's the task tomorrow? It's, in there. it's a discussion board task. I, from memory, it's about Susanna buying a cat. Is my memory of what it is, but I haven't looked. Yeah.